welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for what we are very excited about this conversation. I think Amanda, Maggie and I have already enjoyed preparing for it and thinking about uh, what we might like to say today. Um, so this is our webinar on uh, introducing the idea of using the personal boardroom for, as, as we rather grandly call it, social good. Um, but Maggie's such an imaginative um, person that the way that she's chosen to pick up and run with this in a setting that is just so incredibly different from, the, from anything that Amanda and I had accounted uh, is just very inspiring. So um, we will be hearing more from, from you, Maggie, in just a moment. Um, just to clarify what this is for, just uh, so everyone's clear, this is really for you. We're not introducing the personal boardroom framework. We're assuming you know something about it. This is really for you using it in your work, be that as a trainer facilitator, as, as Maggie is, um, be that as a coach, a mentor, or in any other capacity which um, you will you know, bring, to, bring to us today. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping if you haven't used the Zoom platform before. So you should somewhere see a menu that looks a bit like the one um, at the bottom of this screen here, uh, if, if you can see. Um, so you should see something that looks like a microphone with, with mute. Uh, if you're using your video, you can, you can stop and start video. You can see who's on by, by uh, clicking on where it says participants. I think if you're joining from mobile, uh, on a mobile size screen, you may have to sort of tap down at the bottom of the screen to see this menu. Um, and there is also, I think, a way to raise your hand and to chat. Uh, down on that bottom menu. So chat, if you open up chat, it sh you should see something like this where you can ask a question uh, either directly to uh, everyone or to uh, the panellists, which I think is me. Um, so as questions come to you while Maggie and Amanda are talking, um, please put your questions there and I'm going to watch them and then I will kind of chair a question and answer session um, towards the end. So. Uh, any other housekeeping problems, um, put something in the chat window if you can find it. Uh, I guess I don't have to think about you know, where the fire exits are, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> um, to you. Uh, so just, just as a recap uh, on why we're here, I mean, Amanda and I came together quite a few years ago now with a shared kind of interest and, and passion uh, for exploring networks. And we felt that there, were, there, was, there was scope for a you know, better way of helping people organize their networks and they, they, for, for me it's kind of nice quite nicely summed up in this cartoon um you can imagine walking into a library and not having any way to find your your the book that could be really useful to you at that point in time i think sometimes our networks are a bit like that we know loads of people um and there is enormous potential in the people that we know but sometimes it's hard to work out exactly who can be useful given a challenge that you have uh, or, or a, you know, an opportunity that you're, you're looking for. And we thought, wouldn't it be great if we could bring something structured together? As you know, we came up with the concept of uh, asking people who is in your personal boardroom and what we love about that is the fact that it really focuses you in on, at the heart of your network, are you investing in the relationships that can really help you succeed? So we drew the conversation in right into the question of, you know, we know that networks are important for success, but have you got the essence of a successful network? And as you will also know, we developed the idea that there are 12 roles that you could you need to fill around the table in your personal boardroom. Um, and I'm not going to go through each of the roles, but I will just touch on one which is important to us today. So one of the roles that we feel is vital for your personal boardroom is the inspirer role. And we always define that from the very beginning, the inspirer was someone who moves in a different world from you. Uh, probably knows different people from you, largely, and because of that, they can bring a really kind of different perspective and surprising ingenious <coughs> ideas to you because they're able to access stuff that you're not, you're not exposed to on a day-to-day -day basis. That's the role of an inspirer, and we always saw Maggie as an inspirer. She was always kind of in, in our in our ecosystem as, as such. And then one day, uh, as you will hear more, Maggie came to us and said, um, you know, I've, I've, got, I've got this opportunity coming up and I really think the personal boardroom framework could, could help. Um, and so we hope that for you today also, you, know, you will leave with having had some inspiration from Maggie about 
this is a really different way to use the personal boardroom framework. And you know, here we go, let's get to know more about it. So uh, the way this is going to work is I'm going to now hand over to Amanda, who will, uh, who will have a conversation with Maggie lasting probably for about 25 minutes. Uh, and then we'll hopefully allow time for you to ask your questions. And as I said in my email to you, uh, Amanda and I will stay on the line after uh, uh, 1.30 as well, in case you have other questions or just things you'd like to discuss. Um, so uh, Amanda, over to you. Lovely. Um, Maggie, I selfishly said, can I interview you today? And, uh, and that is uh, because part of this project uh, actually allowed me to come and, and do some of the delivery with you. So uh, it's, I think it's now over a year since that work took place. And, uh, and it's a delight to have you really with us today and to be able to relive some of that experience with uh, some of the people who are listening. Um, so the first thing in a way I wanted to ask you was the name inclusive innovation is really interesting. What is the problem that your company, Inclusive Innovation, really tries to fix? Well, I like the way you, I like the way you asked that question. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you to the both of you for having me, and thank you to the people who come to hear us because you're important. Otherwise, we wouldn't have anyone new to talk to. So, thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Um, inclusive Innovation. It is exactly what it sounds like. It's about including people who are usually excluded either from the process of innovation or the outcome of innovation. Uh, so what, what we see happening in, in innovation that happens in some of the developing world is that the global north wants to fix problems for the global south. And I think what inclusive innovation means to do is to make sure that those people for whom the innovations are going to have the most impact get a say and get to partake in it and get to participate in it. And, and participate is kind of the key word. I mean, inclusive innovation is an initiative of no innovation. And no innovation is known for bringing together scientists from distinctly different disciplines and gathering them around a very complex question and inviting them to come up with research project proposal ideas that are um, in fact step changing. And they often say to us, we don't know how we came together with all of those ideas in such a short period of time. And we kind of get tickled by the fact that we surprise them with their own ingenuity, you know? And I think that's something that we felt like, okay, we do this with scientists. We were inspired, speaking of inspiration and inspirers, by a colleague and friend of mine, Bridget Helms, who did a lot of work in the development field. And I would be with her and I would think, you know, our methodology could work in with development banks and with NGOs and, 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 and in this domain. And we just, instead of different scientists, we bring together different stakeholders. And um, she kind of inspired me to start inclusive innovation. And I think really what we mean to do is to help people who are in resource poor places um, to be more included, more financial inclusion, more inclusion in daily life, more included in coming up with the ideas that will help make their lives better. Okay, so um, you've, in a way, you've you've touched on some of the names of the uh, the, the funders and things that you work with. Um, what would be really nice to know is is you know in all of that work, what was the project that led to you thinking? Actually, I think personal boardroom has a role here, and that I could use it. it was started by the State Department, the U.S. State Department, and they went to an organization called AAAS. That's the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And despite the fact that they're American, they have a global reach. And they had a program called GIST, which is Global Innovation for Science and Technology Entrepreneurs. And it's one of those jobs, I think all of us have had this experience where a job kind of falls in your lap. And it was early on in, the, in, in Inclusive Innovation's um, first year of startup and so any job that came to me I was eager to take it because I wanted to test and see if our methodology which is very interactive and immersive and and participative if it would work in different cultures and countries and regions so I said yes and the assignment was to do a, a networking workshop for women in science and technology uh, and the countries that they chose to do it in were the Ivory Coast and Nigeria and Mozambique. Um, and so, you know, I just said yes, because inclusive innovation and no innovation, I mean, we do process, we teach process. 
and we facilitate using a process and we can work with just about any content. So I said, yeah, I'll figure out the content later. <laughs> I said, yes, and got the job. Um, and then I sat down to think about, okay, well, you know, really, what, what is the content that I'm going to bring to the table besides our interactive activities? How can I help these uh, women explore? And they're women who I learned from, um, from AAAS and, and the State Department were either at universities or were doing their own entrepreneurial startups that had some science and technology impact. And they really wanted to you know, help those women further their projects by giving them a clue about how to network more effectively. So that was, that was the job. I think what was really interesting to us is that really up until that point, <clears throat> the work that we had done and the framework itself had, um, it probably had quite a corporate focus. It was really helping people inside large organizations to navigate their way around more effectively. Uh, in a kind of a very complex environment. What I'm really interested to know is that you were the first person essentially to take this framework and to imagine it or reimagine it in a very different environment, in a very different culture. So what led you to believe that it could translate across those boundaries and across those borders? Oops, am I, am I muted? Okay. Thank you. Um, believe is the strongest word there because I, I had to believe it if I was going to use it, but I wasn't sure. I think we may have just lost Maggie's sound. Let me just... Uh, Am I there? Still? Okay, okay. It was my fault. I muted you, but then I think we lost your Wi-Fi. You <laughs> muted me, yes. And my Wi-Fi is unstable today, it tells me. Um, I, I don't mean to be gratuitous, but it's true that this is one of the few business help books that I've read cover to cover. I mean, quite often, two chapters in, you get it, and it becomes redundant. But I really, not only did you give us an overview at the beginning, then each chapter had depth. And I read the whole book, and I, I was quite inspired by the book. And I felt like the underlying principle of personal boardroom is... There are people out there who want you to succeed. You just need to find them and ask them to help you. And I just thought that's, that, that, that's exactly what these women need. They need to find I think oh, we've lost. Oh no, I'm, I'm here. Yes, you're back, Maggie. Okay. Um, when faced with the challenge of taking networking, which can sometimes be considered a pejorative term or at least a superficial term, I felt like the boardroom would be uh, a mechanism to help them get a core network that would help them really have depth. And if you have depth in your core network, as you all know, you'll have depth in the more extended network. What did you feel were the biggest challenges in actually bringing this to your audience in those three different countries? Um, well, I think the translation was mm -hmm. maybe the, the hardest part because we, in the Ivory Coast, the workshop was in, and, uh, and I did, it was in English, and then in Mozambique, it was in Portuguese, and I was unable to, to do that. I had a, a conflict of those dates, and I was excited that Amanda would go down and do it, and and had that experience of working with those women and working in another language. So just, just even translating some of the different roles was a challenge because they're very nuanced. So how do you say nerve giver in French and in Spanish and in Portuguese? And, um, and we, we're still, there's still debate about what's the right term to use. Um, I had a couple of different translators work with me on it. And even then there was disagreement. We, and even translating the term personal boardroom. You know, that's, um, we, I think we ended up just keeping it as personal boardroom because, uh, for instance, in French, the translation just seemed so literal. It was like the actual conference room itself rather than sort of the concept of a personal boardroom. So I think, you know, the translation, you know, was, was maybe the hardest part of it. Um, and then I, I, I wondered, you know, this idea, the concept of a personal boardroom is something that's very clear to us if we have our toes in the corporate workplace. And, and and very quickly they got, they got it like like that. It was a challenge I didn't need to worry about. 
So part of the the challenge at the beginning, in a way, was a was a physical one, which is actually I need to translate this into languages that it hasn't existed in before, and uh, it was very exciting to see how you did that. Did you feel that the roles themselves actually worked? I mean, when you when you actually went to bring it into the room, you were sitting in Nigeria with a group of expectant science technologists, and you started to use. Um, the terms customer voice and you started to talk about nerve givers and things. Did you feel it worked or, or did you feel looking back now that there were other things that you you might have considered in trying to translate it to this audience? Say, oh, maybe there's another role that they were thinking. While, while we're waiting for Maggie, I'm just going to... Yeah, I'm back. Oh, so jump forward. Maggie, I might just suggest that you um, switch your camera off. It might just okay. give you a tiny bit more bandwidth. Do you want to try uh, that? I, yes, yes. I, I do apologize. Um, we have to have a conversation with our internet service provider very soon. Um, uh, one of the things, because it's very interactive, what we do, we didn't just stand up and say, here are the roles, and what do you think about them? We actually did an activity where the participants had to think about all the benefits that they might get from anybody in their network. And they did these on post-it notes and the whole wall was blanketed with all of these and then cluster them and, and kind of cross our fingers to hope that what would emerge from those clusters, it would mean much more to them if they saw the roles emerge from the benefits that they had come up with than if we had just said, here are the roles. And it did, I mean, it just did. For me, it was kind of magical how it just came out exactly matching. And then that really gave them a sense of understanding what the role was, because the roles were built out of the benefits that they had put up on the wall. Um, when we've done it before, uh, we tend, you know, we have probably introduced it, um, in a slightly more directive way. I mean, what, what is lovely to see, and it's a reminder actually looking at these images, actually how, um, how much flexibility you brought into the room in terms of how people interpreted it themselves. Uh, so, you know, I really love the fact that you just gave people permission to make their own maps. Uh, to, so to take the, the roles in their simplest forms and then start to think about how their existing relationships fitted with those roles. Um, I see some lovely examples here of some of the maps that, that people created. Um, if you were to go back, just say tomorrow the project was beginning all over again, Maggie, is there anything having had the experience that you might do differently the next time? Well, um, as always, I always have this feeling after a workshop, I wish I had more time, time to go deeper. Um, for instance, so you see here the maps. These are maps that we had to make. The, the maps, maybe, Zell, if you want to go back, the, the first maps on that very slide there, that, those are maps that I made um, to show people what their maps might look like. I wanted to give them an idea that they could construct it in many different ways. And then later on, as you see in the following... So I think if I remember rightly, these three maps were all done by you, Maggie, um, in preparation for the workshop. I see. I remember you saying something. Yeah, about they were. You really were, put yourself through it. Yeah, they were just meant to demonstrate for them. Yes, and I and I put myself through it absolutely to practice it. Um, but I love their maps. If you can go back to the visual of their maps, because they're really beautiful. Um, and they, you know, they took it to heart and, and did it in their own way. Um, and then what I had them do was I did a, a, a segment on, well, what we kind of pre preparing elevator pitches, although I don't like the term pitch, so I call it an approach. And they developed their elevator approaches. And we did some skill building on how you develop a short a short get you know something to capture someone's attention and then they practiced it with partners in a in a speed dating uh, setup in fact so they got to practice it six or seven times i could do it again i would allow them to pick another major role that they wanted to approach and then maybe two or three other ones and do the same experience that they could really practice 
different kinds of conversations that they need to have um, and get feedback from their partners and polish them so that they would leave the workshop not only having an idea about who the key roles are in their boardroom, what the ask is, but they would have practiced more doing the ask. And I think that was a very valuable part of the workshop. I wonder if you can remember, I know it's some time ago, but were there particular roles that you felt that as a group that they picked out and wanted to practice more than others? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, if you consider that half of these women had some entrepreneurial effort they were trying to sell, that they were really interested in, you know, the, the roles that had to do with getting resources, you know. Um, so the knowledge roles were, you know, important, but, you know, maybe I would say the most important role was, you know, the one who helps them find money, you know, uh, the connector certainly and, um, and the nerve the giver, unlocker. <laughs> the unlocker, the connector, and but the nerve giver too. A lot of them were quite intrigued, quite intrigued with this idea that there was somebody who just gave you the courage to go get it. And and all of them had a nerve giver, and all of them understood that, even though that was probably one of the roles I was the most concerned about how to translate. So once they've done their their maps, which help them to label people who are currently in their network. Um, it struck me that you had some really wonderful creative ways of then encouraging them to kind of stretch and think and extend their network from where it is now to where it needed to be. Um, I, I just wonder whether you could give us one or two examples of the, of the process that you, that you used in order to help people think about how to extend their networks? Sure. Well, the, the first part about creating their, their boardroom, I had them make a list of everybody and anybody they knew who might be someone they need to connect with, and then go through that and kind of check off the people who they could put in their, in their closest network. Uh, but then I invited them to having drawn that map and even taken a break from it, I think I did it the next day, um, to go back and look at that list and and try to match up some of those people on that list with it. And I encourage them to think of people that they didn't know, but they wish they knew as well. And um, to try to map how those people might be connected to the people in their boardroom um, or how the people in their boardroom could point them in that direction. And they made a, you know, instead. I think asks. the minute I speak, ah, oh, Maggie's back. And, that, and those turn into asks and those would be, you know, help them think about, I think those, and some of those were incorporated into uh, the approaches that they practice later on. So you got them to do, spend time planning and thinking, and you also brought in uh, opportunity for them to practice within the program itself. Uh, what did you encourage them to do afterwards? So once the program is finished, can you remember some of the things that you uh, encourage people to do as a way to take this forward into their, their life beyond the program? Um, yeah, and I, I just want to say that the practice was such a critical part of it because mm -hmm. I And again, back is important. Um, and then I think the challenge to the group after the event was that they were supposed, the original challenge from um, AAAS and the State Department was to come up with, I think, you know, add um, 100 people to their network. Um, and so we talked a lot about, well, is it better to add 100 people to your network or to add 10 more strong people who are really going to uh, support you and reinforce you? Um, but I think they still were supposed to, to try to add more people to their network. Um, but that was the only way we really, we really did measure what they did afterwards. And so many of them achieved their goal. And I'd like to think they were able to add more people to their network um, because they had these strong connections internally. Fantastic. So at the beginning of this, you talked a little bit about how in inclusive innovation works and the different types of partners that you bring together. Having taken the leap and used the personal boardroom in this particular project, 
do you see possibilities in other work that you do at Inclusive Innovation to, to use this framework again? Yes, so much. I mean, Inclusive Innovation has three targets. One is um, NGOs and UN organizations. Another one is development banks. And the third one, which I guess this sort of falls under, is the science societies or organizations supporting scientific advancement. Um, I'm doing a lot of work with science leadership Africa and in Southeast Asia. And in fact, there's a global organization of early and mid-career scientists called the Global Young Academy, who is more and more using innovation to inclusive innovation to do capacity building at a couple of events coming up in the next year for both the Africa Science Leadership Program, the ASEAN Science Leadership Program, and the GYA, where we would bring in uh, you know, this methodology. But even more exciting was last week I was at the World Science Forum and it was a fascinating panel of uh, women, Arab women in science. And they were really talking about the challenges that they But B, I, I think I have a tool to help you feel more opportunity to speak with them, some people who are involved with that after the panel. And I'm hoping that I might be able to bring the personal boardroom to some of the women who were you know, present in that panel and that workshop to show them that in fact, they do know how to network and they can do a very good job of it. Were there any, Maggie, do tell me if you can't hear me, um, your voice is just going in and out a little bit. Um, with the, you're just making me think with the, the, the women scientists that you've um, been with very recently, do you think there are any roles in the personal boardroom that present a particular challenge to a female audience in terms of building their networks? Surely. Um... I think that they, I'm looking here at my French version, um, you know, the inspirer is certainly, in all of their stories, there was somebody who inspired them. Um, I think also the navigator becomes someone very critical to them. Um, and, the, and the nerve giver, because they have often to enter into territory where, you know, no one has done it. I mean, a lot of the women on the panel were the first woman in, you know, this chemical engineering thing, or the first woman in this, you know, th these hardcore science areas. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, they all talked about um, how important those particular roles were for them. Mm. What advice might you give? We, we have a number of people on the call today. They may be coaches, facilitators, mentors. They may be working outside of a corporate environment, and they may be interested in the idea of bringing this framework into their work. Um, what advice might you give somebody who might be interested today? Um, well, I think the, the first advice, and this is true for every activity that might be included in a workshop, but this one especially, is to do it yourself and to really do it, not just read the book or not just go do the instrument, but really do the, make the list of all the people, um, make, a, you know, make a map for yourself, um, think about the ask that you would have. I mean, so when I was planning this, um, my, my mother-in-law happened to be visiting and also my daughter, my oldest of two daughters, who at the time was 14. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the three maps that you saw earlier that I used were ones that came out of my doing of it, but this is my daughter's um, some code names like, you know, the King of Awesome, which I really liked. Um, but I, we did it, I did it myself and it made it so much easier for me to convey to the participants in the workshop what the roles meant. And since I had ideas about who those roles were for me, I could help them when they put, when, you know, once they were working on their maps and someone would call me over and say, I'm not quite sure about this role because I knew who that person was. Make that connection more easily. Um, so I think it's important to walk the talk anyway. Um, but I think especially with this methodology, I, it was just so much easier for me to transmit 
the strength of the archetypes that are in, that are in here um, because I had done it myself. Were there any particular learnings for you when you did it yourself uh, about the degree to which you rely on certain people, but that yeah. you might, you know, as, as a professional, as a facilitator, we fall into all the same traps as the people we work with. Was, totally. was there anything about your own experience that you'd like to share today? Only that I, I was sort of stunned that I was relying on the same people. And they were people that I'd known for a long, long time. And, and I found that it was a really good opportunity to think about, okay, who are some of the newer people who I've met in the last decade <laughs> who, who, you know, have very deliberate energy cultivating those relationships not and and not losing the other ones, you know, the silver and gold and all that. And you keep new friends, but um, to 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 put more dynamism into my energy by using some newer contacts who knew me and my newer self as well. Yes, yes. Uh, that that noise there was actually just me keeping an eye on the timing because I just wanted to make sure that we didn't that we didn't go beyond our allocated time. And um, it would be really nice if you have questions that you'd like to pitch to Maggie. I appreciate we're having a slight kind of technical issue. Your voice is going in and out, but but let's see if we can, um, if I go back to you, Zella, you'd probably be monitoring questions that people might like to ask. Um, we have, um, we do have one question, which I think is, it looks like it's from you, Maggie, but I think it's probably from Donna Lynn, who is your colleague. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes, sorry, it's me. Yeah, Donna Lynn, would you like to um, say your question rather than me, me read it out? Yeah, sure. So it's actually a couple different questions all rolled into one, Maggie. So I was really curious about kind of the follow up to this initial work um, and how um, the participants actually implemented um, their boardrooms, if they kind of had learning from it. So I was wondering, like, if they changed the, the different archetypes over time or digestion or um, how they felt maybe empowered in their ability to actually reach out because that was one of the things that I took from the boardroom was how it really empowers you to solicit very explicit feedback from very specific people and so I was just wondering if there was feedback on on that and then I guess the last piece of that question was if there was any of the roles that were particularly difficult mm -hmm. for them kind of being these um, women in science, I, I just imagine that some of them might be a little bit more challenging. So I, I guess I'm just looking for kind of feedback on how the how they how they um, implemented everything after the event. Well, I wish I could give you more feedback um, because I was I was brought in as a facilitator, and I do have I've maintained contact with two or three of the participants who found me on LinkedIn or who I just you know had a connection with and stayed in touch with. Um, but overall, I, I wasn't engaged in the follow-up on the project, um, except to, you know, have occasional feedback from AAAS saying, you know, where, they'd, where they had come. I can't answer that question except to say, you know, one, one woman, and it's a focus group of women, more success in gathering funds for her project and, you know, was going to be able to launch something. And so I found that one thing to hear. Um, as for a role that was difficult for them to engage, um, they were really good at the, the voice of the client. They really got that and, and that, that you know, is, bodes well for entrepreneurs. Um, you know, I think they, they, they weren't quite sure um, you know, and the connector was also something that was really easy for them. You know, I think maybe the unblocker was a little bit harder for them. And the expert, I think the expert, they were a little bit intimidated by some of the experts and didn't quite know how to approach them. Yeah, that's kind of exactly what I was thinking. So when I was trying to kind of walk myself through this creation, I, I, I liked feeling more empowered to have that conversation, but I, I feel like that would still be really challenging in the group that you were facilitating it with. Thank Interestingly, you. Maggie, I was thinking back to the group that I worked with in yeah. Mozambique, and again, I did pick up a, a cultural difference, um, particularly around the roles of the sponsors and the unlockers that I hadn't really come across before. And 
it was actually one of kind of mistrust that people might say, yes, I will help you. Yes, I will give you money. Yes, I will support you. But that they didn't necessarily believe that that person would follow through. Um, and so you know, that, that was something I, re I remember thinking, gosh, I hadn't really experienced that before. Uh, and, and whether that was, again, to do with kind of women who are really at the kind of cutting edge of trying to do things that hadn't been done before or being or working through networks that uh, hadn't had women asking those questions before was something that I felt that, uh, you know, that they were challenged by. I, I, and I don't know if, if you experienced any of that in the, the groups that you worked with. Yeah, it does. Yes, I. Yeah. Um, you Maggie, can we hear you? Yes, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you now. Okay. All right, I'm terribly sorry about the internet issues. Uh, so Maggie, we didn't really hear your answer to that question. Well, uh, so my, my answer was that yes, I, I did experience that and it did not surprise me because mm -hmm. I didn't have anything to compare it to as, as you have, but what I did have was a sense of how the rule of law in those countries is very different and how mm -hmm. that has an influence you know, beyond in terms of the, the professional ways that people, um, you know, the professional conduct that people have with each other. So it would make sense that the women were like, well, okay, but are they really... So um, I'm going to jump in, cause, Maggie, because we've lost you. Um, oh, oh. <laughs> we, we got halfway through that answer. So Joe Gray, you asked um, how much background uh, about the background script. Joe, do you, do you want to um, uh, chip in rather than sure. looking at your question? <laughs> Hi there. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm just. I'm thrilled to hear you say what you said, Maggie, because I came across the personal boardroom many years ago, um, and in my new role working in in the voluntary sector, could really see how it, it would be able to work. So to have you say it has worked with you know various uh, adjustments, I think is just brilliant. I just wondered. I really love how you've drawn out. Um, you know, you got the, the group to draw their maps and draw out who they were identifying as useful people. I just wondered then how much background and description based on all your knowledge of the roles uh, and everything that goes on with them that you then shared with the room, or did you allow that just to kind of, to allow them to define that as they, they drew the map under those headings? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, after they clustered all the benefits, and I asked them to kind of name what they thought that role was and then I revealed it was fun to do the reveal of the different um, roles and then we kind of talked about what each role was and I was able then to give them a bit of the background from you know Azella and Amanda's writing so I did give them I didn't spend I pro probably spent about 15 20 minutes going over all the roles before they did their maps okay mm. Lovely. So uh, got Joe, the I, I might maybe, just, maybe, yeah, what you did, Amanda, might have been, what did you do? No, 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 it's exactly the same, Joe, in a way, just to take a tiny step back. I, in terms of the methodology that, uh, that Maggie brought into this workshop, it was, it was a similar to something that we mm. have done in other workshops, where rather than just presenting the roles and actually putting, um, you know, putting the labels out there directly we actually start with a question which is what are the benefits that you want people in your network to bring you and then on a kind of a huge sheet of paper if you've got a wall big enough you actually can get people to put on post-its all the different benefits that they can think of and then as a group they cluster them and what we find is that those clusters more often than not generate at least eight of the 12 roles that we can then introduce but having had that clustering exercise uh, come first, by the time you say, you know what, from all the things that you said, this really sounds like a customer voice. Um, you're actually using uh, what's in people's heads and what's in the group to define the labels. So I, I, I think that's what uh, Maggie used. And certainly uh, when I did it in the Mozambique group, that really, really helped people to have a sense of ownership 
over the, the maps that they then created. And I would say too that I think they, they got at least eight out of the 12, maybe even more, mm. maybe nine or 10 in Nigeria. Um, that they really, you know, it, for me, it was a great thing. They're archetypes and every culture can relate to those roles. Mm -hmm. we, it can be quite revealing too, because Amanda and I have a, a sort of legendary occasion with a client who shall remain nameless. Uh, individuals uh, participate in the exercise that you've just described. So this is a big corporate uh, and they uh, clustered all the benefits that they thought the different people in their network provided. And there was one role that was missing and it was the customer voice role and i think they were all rather horrified <laughs> when they realized that you know, they had not thought about their customer in in all of this uh, and that in itself was was quite a, a useful moment i think for them in in terms of understanding what why this exercise is so valuable because it helps you just make sure you're getting the, the broader perspective from outside as well as inside you know your little world um, so we have a question from Maria. Uh, Maria, are you? Uh, would you like to uh, speak your question to us? Sure. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Well. Okay. Great. Um, thank you for that talk. It was very, um, very enjoyable and very insightful. And um, I was just wondering to what extent people maybe knew each other in the room, and to what extent that they found that it was actually a networking opportunity for them and how they might actually use that as a platform to enhance their personal boardroom. And I know you mentioned that you didn't actually, you know, follow up afterwards. Maybe you could kind of sense that in the room when you were there at the workshops. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely could. And, and I'm sure Amanda had a similar experience. Um, I think a few of the participants might have known each other, but for the most part, they were strangers when they started. Mm. Our workshops are very immersive. So, you know, by the end of the two days, and actually the Ivory Coast for the three days, um, they were hugging and, um, and they did not want to leave each other. And, and what was interesting is that I saw some of the maps um, emerge and then I saw them add to the maps um, when they found connections with other people. We also did an activity which was a you know, give and take uh, at the very end of the workshop where we said to people, you know, what, what would you think you can give to other people in this room? And what would you hope that they might be able to give to you that you could take away? Um, and we did kind of a marketplace where people roamed around and people got quite animated. And I saw people going to their maps afterwards and adding names of people in the room to their map. So it was a great networking for them. And I think that those groups stayed together and, and they may have had like WhatsApp groups afterwards where they really stayed connected. That's great. Thank you for that. So I am looking um, at the time and I, I am going to bring this sort of formal bit of the, of the webinar to a close, uh, as I said I would, um, uh, because there's one other thing that I wanted to say uh, and then if, but if you'd like to carry on chatting then we would be delighted so we'll still be here. So I just, I'm just going to zoom back through um, these slides to let you, just remind you really, you probably already know this, um, we made our web app uh, free so anyone can go online and think about their own personal boardroom so you are free to use that with anyone you come across you think it might be useful to um, we also decided sort of in 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 the spirit of trying to open up our intellectual property uh so for people to use to make our book free online so that you can download copies of it or onto your kindle or uh, in a pdf form um, and you can find about that on our website. And the other thing is that Maggie's referred to translations and also to her packs of cards. Uh, so you may or may not have seen that we have physical packs of cards that uh, we use in workshop settings um, mainly, and they are fantastic because they, they, it's a really tangible, tactile mm -hmm. thing that people can get working on. Um, and I know they're also really useful for in kind of coaching conversations and you know with a sometimes I've given them to people who are mentors and think, oh, you know, this is great, I'm going to use this with my mentee. Um, so we are selling them and we've, we've got them for sale in English, but with uh, the help of Maggie and also with Joe Gray, who's on with us as well, uh, we're, we're looking at translating them. We've already got a Portuguese version, um, which um, Amanda used in Mozambique. There is a French version and a Spanish version. Uh, and Joe is uh, very helpfully thinking about um, 
kind of Russian as well, which is very exciting. Um, so I, I kind of I haven't advertised the fact that we're selling all other languages, uh, but if you if you have a need, then please do shout because then we'll make it happen. Uh, and I, I imagine that over time we'll we'll get this sorted out. But if someone clamors for it, then it's going to get sorted out sooner. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you to you all for, for joining us and especially to you, Maggie, for kind of sharing um, your, your, your expertise and your enthusiasm and your vision for what personal boardroom can be. And it's just wonderful to hear someone else describe it. Um, you know, I think what you said earlier was just the absolute nugget of it, but I've never said it like this, which is, you know, there are people out there who want you to help, who want to help you. It's just a case of, you know, finding them and asking them, you know, I, I think you said it the best you could possibly say it there so a big thank you from me uh, for, for joining us today and from amanda too i'm sure amanda very much so maggie lovely to reconnect um and so just and just to respond to jane's uh question jane you said wonderful you're making a book free very in the cards uh, i presume i can buy it by website the answer is yes um so that's the, the close of the formal proceedings. If anyone has other questions, thoughts, ideas, you know, mad plans, then please stay. Uh, but appreciate you know busy lives. So if you need to, to head off, then thank you very much. And the last thank thing you. actually, I was just going to say, thank which uh, Jane um, asked about a recording. So if there is anybody you know who you think you'd like to share this with, um, nice. we can certainly make a recording of uh, of of this call available. Great. Um, Janet, I don't know if you're still here, but thank you very much for um, your message too. Uh, Janet's been a long-standing uh, supporter and indeed uh, participant in the personal boardroom journey. So, uh, Janet, you said uh, something to me how you work with groups and have a view of uh, your group itself. I think that's that's to you, Maggie. Um, it all came very much to life, so thank you. Uh, Good, yeah, thank I you. It's fun for me. <laughs> thank you. Other questions, uh, comments, thoughts? <laughs> my, my big question really is, yeah, how do we start using it? And what's your guidance if we really want to, um, to, to kick this off? Because, yeah, I have a big belief in it. Uh, it was a really good question. I, I, we, Amanda and I had a bit of a joke last week because I, I think we feel like... I don't think it's a given blood, but it doesn't take very long a long time for your pint of blood to be hyphened out of you. But I, a few months ago, I was uh, present with someone who had a, a blood transfusion. It takes a very long time for the for the blood to be put, put into someone else's body, and it feels a bit like that process at the moment. Like, you know, mm. we're keen for you guys to pick it up, but actually I think the process of you internalising it and mm. deciding how you want to use it is very much mm. in your pace. And you know, we, we, we would love to do whatever we can to help you sort of accelerate that but in the end you, 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 I guess it's it's um, going to be different for different uh, of you and the, I don't know, Joe I know that you're really thinking about you know doing something at scale so uh, that kind of yeah. challenges when you think about different countries um, but you know Maggie your experience is, is that you can sort of t take on someone else's uh, tools because I guess that you do that quite a bit in the, in the world of creative problem solving and, and, and innovation. You know, there are lots of open source tools. That, so I guess you're quite adept. Well, yeah. well it's, and it's fun. It's, it's fun to take on new tools. I think for me, you know, what, it's listening to the needs of the people that you're encountering because it's just, I'm hearing it all the time when people are talking about what they need. It's very clear to me that the personal boardroom can help them. So I can think of about five workshops where I could actually inject personal boardroom in the next year um, and so it's really a matter of you know, hearing that and then, and then letting people know that it's there to do it. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, Joe, That's very inspiring. To, yeah, Joe, if I was to ask you in a way the question the other way around, it's, mm. it probably, you know, what a, you know, what would stop you um, from picking it up and running it? So in a way, if you can think about what, what the, what the obstacles might be and we could kind of work out the best way of helping you over yeah. those. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's not that I think it's just it's a different context so I'm always two step back from the actual beneficiary so for me it's I we are a network organization I have 50 members around the world who potentially uh, full of trainers um, uh, who then work with entrepreneurs 
who I then want to help understand this and then in the same way decide how they want to use that and everyone will will do it differently in their context and culture. Um, so I need to help them understand this. Um, yeah. There's a bit of a sales bit to them. I, you know, I have a belief in it. I, I know lots of people will. So um, there's an element of a slow build, trying to get a few key partners in, my, in, in the network to go, yes, and we start to see that happen and then help them to understand people. Some people are very experienced trainers. Some people um, are not. So it's a mixed level of those who could just take it and run with it. And some people will need some help at thinking um, and some quite specific help and thinking, what, okay, I'm in a room with 20 entrepreneurs. What am I, you know, exactly what will I do to bring this to life for people? Um, so no, I, I think I just need to do some thinking about what's going to be the best way to, to roll that out. And it will be like all things start small, get some good mm. stories. Um, and I think it will, I think mm. it will take pace. Um, I am really inspired by hearing your, your story, uh, Maggie, and how it's worked because I could see that, but it's always hard to, um, yeah, to verbalize that sometimes when it's just a, a thought. So, um, yes, I need to sit back and think about, um, about what people need to know to start with and then how we build on that and get people to start using it and help them to do that well. Mm. Maggie, Lovely. You, well, it's certainly, Joe, in, in a way, once you've done that thinking after today, mm. um, you know, do come back and ask us how we can help you do that. Um, it does sound as if you could find the facilitators who are in the sort of Maggie end of experience might yeah. be your kind of early champions because yeah. they might just have that confidence uh, to, you know, uh, absorb a framework and then find a way of translating it into a room. So if, if, if as you said, you can build one or two stories of their experience, that will probably help them to amplify um, uh, a sense of possibility in others who are less experienced. Mm. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I had a similar question. I was working with a, a group yesterday, a job care group that work with job seekers. Uh, mm. And they were, to, they were very interested in how to translate this particular model for people who are, um, who are resource poor and who are trying to get back into work. And I think they have the same sort of hesitancy of, you know, are we experienced enough ourselves to be able to take a framework which has been used in one setting and have the confidence to try to translate that for our audience. Uh, so in a way where we came out there was that I would probably run a simple workshop, I'm not sure whether it'll be a webinar or it'll be a face-to-face -face with, you know, the key trainers, the, the key facilitators, um, and they experience it themselves in the way that Maggie did, you know, they try it on for themselves. Um, so it is but sort of probably teach one, learn one, do one. Yes. Um, and and I'm, I'm sure that the experience for facilitators of actually trying it out is the thing that builds the greatest confidence. So yeah, moving yeah. them towards participation is probably, um, you know, the, the most useful thing to focus on. Yeah, agreed. Maggie, Thank you. Thank you. you had any thoughts on that? Sorry? Uh, just wondered, Maggie, if you're still okay. with us. Oh. Any thoughts to back to Joe on, because a lot of what you do is, is really about empowering you know, other facilitators to take their own methods, isn't it? Yeah, I guess, you know, I, I think, as I said, it really helped me to go through the activity of making the lists yeah. of people and making the map myself. And it gave me ideas about how to be authentic when I, when I shared it with other people. So yeah. I come back to that same piece of advice. I think what Amanda said is pretty spot on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, Maria, agreed. Maria, yeah. So have questions. Yeah, I just have a couple of questions. They're, they're kind of completely unrelated, but they're both related to the personal boardroom, so that's good. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Um, my first question was about, um, maybe it linked to what you were talking about, job seekers, Amanda, was mm -hmm. about the idea of looking at people like the most recent um, alumni or groups that are trying to kind of connect with people, like say they can be in you know, higher education institutions or what might... Um, and they're trying to figure out ways to help them develop their, you know, we'll call it a wider kind of social capital, but this is actually much more targeted social capital. And to what extent that alumni groups or alumni associations could use this kind of model? And had that ever been thought before? That was my first question. And I, I don't know if you want to answer that and I can give you my second question after, I don't know. 
I'll jump in with that one. I've, I've done yeah. several talks with alumni groups. Um, oh, great. Short talk. And actually, um, uh, Jane Barrett, who was here, mm. um, but she, uh, she had asked us and Amanda did a couple of webinars with alumni groups. Mm. Um, I think because the university is always trying to keep, get alumni to sort of both connect with each other and have successful careers, you know, it's kind of double whammy mm. this tool. So, so yes, absolutely. It's, it's a big good tool. Mm. Um, that Great. I, think, that, um, yeah. I think Maria, when it, when we've used it before with alumni groups, it's been, I suppose it, it's been helping them to use the labels to identify people within that alumni network that could help them. So it allows, in a way, it, it allows them to be much more targeted in their approach. And the difference between an alumni group and um, a job seeker who may not have that kind of club to be a part of is that there is usually there's kind of shared history there's a sort of shared understanding mm -hmm. there's the basis of some form of trust so in, it's much easier for somebody in an alumni group to reach out to another person and ask them to navigate or provide some expertise than it is for somebody on the street looking mm -hmm. for that kind of help so i think the alumni group tends to frame um uh the work very easily and the personal boardroom roles then just help you to label and target your conversations uh and and certainly when i've done it within the, uh, with alumni groups that the feedback has always been this you know this really helps and this helps mm. activate the alumni network um I, I i think you had the same experience Ella, when you mm. did it uh when you did it with the london business school recently mm. didn't you mm. yeah yeah um yeah i think that's i think you're right that there is there is a shared experience that goes within my groups perhaps too so we're something to build on yeah no, it is something that i would i would completely I agree with you and i do there is a big difference i think it's about um having the alumni recognize that they actually have this group so they might do things yes. like um you know they develop a linkedin page and they start to kind of pepper their requests for people you know that are maybe like but they don't understand how to be more targeted and more strategic i guess that's that's where this comes in is that the strategicness so that they don't feel that there's just this big sea of people that they um they might be able to contact but they can be more targeted about how they contact so it seems almost as big as the wide world to them until they actually look at using a tool like this i guess that's what i was thinking mm -hmm. Or, yeah, and also then I think the, the the give and take nature of it that actually the roles help you to identify how you can offer help to other people. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think it was it's both you know if you're trying to uh, encourage an alumni network to come to life and to be active, it's uh, the, you know the roles are useful for both the kind of the, the asking and the offering side. Mm -hmm. um, my other question was just quick was about how this has ever been used in a, an actual like higher education course. Has it been used in a higher education course? Um, like as in, as a tool, like has it ever, you know, been highlighted as a tool that could, you know, they could use as a, I mean, I do, I teach network theory. That's why as part of what I teach. And that's why I was thinking like, this is to me is a really interesting compliment to network theory is yeah. that, you know, to say to people, here's something that you can use. I'm not saying that it would be in the course, but it'd be something that you could be, you know, um, signposting people to. And had that ever been, yeah. had, had that ever come up before? So uh, with executives, uh, certainly in, in higher, edu higher education context, we have used it. Yeah. Okay. Um, we, so Janet Sheath, who was mm. on, uh, she is a sort of very well-established lecturer in careers at Birkbeck. And she, for the first time, said to us, you know, this academic year, she wants to use it on the MSC. Uh, and mm. I think Janet would go about it in a very thoughtful way. It wouldn't it would be something that was sort of incorporated into the, the material as well as signposted to. Um, I, I once did a talk for undergraduates um, mm. which, as a favour to a friend and a long time ago, and I remember it didn't go very down very well at all, <laughs> but I think, I can't even remember whether I used the current, so we, I still didn't have the cards then and so I think, yeah. uh, I guess the issue with undergraduates is um, how ready they are to think about them. Mm. Well, I teach, um, I teach master's students in leadership and management in the okay. community and the public sector. 
And yeah. so these are people that not only is it them that could actually benefit. This is what, what draw, drew me to the webinar to begin with was, so it wasn't just necessarily what they could benefit from it, but how they might be able to get their clients or customers and how they might benefit. So they might have people like job seekers or people that they work at work with in their community to try to build social capital. And they might see this as a tool that they could use. That's what I was thinking that that might be something, you know, so it's about the awareness building of the use of the tool. And that's what I was kind of trying to, um, you know, so it was at two levels, I guess, and an act, you know, that they become aware of it and that they could use it themselves. And then also that they could be, you know, something that, that um, they could be thinking about, you know, that they could be looking to, to bring a, a workshop in for people that they, yeah. 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 No, I, I think that's a, uh, a spot on and obviously, that they're a little bit more mature in um, their, you know, sort of experience of what it means to have a network as well, which, which will help land. Um, I, yeah, I don't know if Amanda, Maggie, you have other thoughts? Well, I, I think the, in, it's very close, the work that I hope to be doing with the Global Young Academy mm -hmm. and through the Africa Science Leadership Programs, these are with early to mid-career scientists and it's a capacity building leadership um, motif that, that that it falls under and I we do a lot of collaborative stuff and we do a lot of uh, you know uncovering what's your own leadership comfort zone etc but um, this I think is a skill building tool that I'm really looking forward to adding to that so I could probably tell you in six months time uh, how it fit into that sort of academic environment if you will which is slightly different than what you're saying but I think pretty close Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much for um, arranging this today. Thank you for joining us. Maria, where are you based? I'm actually, I'm in Ireland. So, okay. yeah. And it, I don't sound like it, but I am. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maria, you sound about as Irish as I do. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's great, eh? So, yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much. This is great. So I have a lot of food for thought and how, you know, so I'm sure. It's we'll I mean, Maria, connecting. and you're not that you're not that geographically far from me so obviously not at all to exactly very That's close to you now yeah. so we can have Fantastic. a chat too thanks very much <laughs> bye thanks now. so much Maria. Bye. thank you Maria. hello ladies yeah so who have we so i think i don't know if um yeah that's maria that's it i think it's that's, just yeah. the three oh, of us well done. yeah well done guys um, wow well, i'm really sorry about my technical <laughs> stuff and no. my voice I don't know what happened. I, I would get this message on my screen, your internet is unstable, and I think, oh man, I'd sort of, oh. sorry about that. No, I, I, what, what I deeply admire is how you were able to detach yourself from, apparently able to detach yourself from the problem, you know, <laughs> wound up by it, but you know, maybe it's just a very um, cool no, Well, you know, we do with enough technical difficulties in life around here. <laughs> Yes. No, it, it's true, Maggie. You stayed very kind of coherent, which I think is always the hard thing. And I and I hope I didn't end up inventing different questions. <laughs> okay. But I I um and I hope I didn't hit you with anything that you you certainly didn't seem to have a difficulty. I I think when it was going silent.